So welcome to Low Level Center Programming and Security Enforcement with uh, MRA. I'm Brendan and I work for Intel in Germany, uh, focusing on developer tools, specifically aimed at GNU Linux user space, and sometimes a few odd tag-alongs like Zephyr. Um, I think they call it like IoT or Fog or something, um, but I think we wonder what that really means. Um, so the agenda for today is we'll go through what libmra and MRA.io is, um, then what we're doing with it at the moment, including our Google Peripheral Manager backend and that we've done for, um, for Brillo, and then some of the work I've been doing on the uh, AGL AFB bus, so the Automotive Grade Linux um, AFB bus. I can't even remember what that stands for. Um, so the first thing we'll do is um, go for a little bit about what Mara is in case, um, well actually um, hopefully none of you know. Um, and Really, the acronym doesn't stand for anything, but I think the M is for monkey, and I'll go through that a little bit more. Uh, a little terminology. Uh, we talk about uh, libmra and rada.io. Um, rada.io is meant to be the API standard, and libmra refers to the Linux implementation of the rada.io um, specification, although it never really got written down properly. Uh, but the aim is that we have multiple uh, rada.io implementations uh, for things like uh, Zephyr, we've kind of got a Windows one, we've had a few other weird and wonderful ones. Um, but really here we're talking about libmra for, for Linux. Um, I started it, uh, MRA a little while ago, and really the, the specific need was code reuse for user space IO based devices. And we did a small hackathon at Mobile World Congress with like the Intel Galileo board, and it was, we thought it was really cool. We gave a little C environment and Eclipse and it kind of was relatively easy to program on. Um, but it turned out that you still need like 100 lines of code plus to just make an LED flash on and off. And turns out most developers thought that was pretty acceptable. Um, and it probably was. Uh, <laughs> and we had one little library. All it did was make an I2C LCD kind of work l relatively easily with a few lines of code. And that was super, super like popular. So we thought, well, we probably need an abstraction layer to make reuse of that code so we can make more useful stuff. And that's kind of how it started. Uh, so to give you an imp impression, it was kind of made rapid prototyping and for making IO work as expected rather than the way it works when you get a standard Linux dev board. Um, and then we kind of went on a little bit further. So the aim was to have an abstraction layer with uh, a level of flexibility uh, which is very, very high so we can support a load of different boards. Uh, we obviously wanted to be open source licensed, so we chose the MIT license because it was just simple and easy. And a lot of it has been written by Intel employees, but we've accepted PRs from just about everyone on GitHub and we collaborate with loads of SFC vendors now, So I'll talk about a little bit. Um, and what Mara essentially does in Linux, it's doing I.O. that's typically reserved for the kernel and moving it into user space. Um, and bringing essentially the, the Arduino you know, header that you see so commonly on Linux single board computers. So you can use it really easily without any special magic, just like you can on a microcontroller. The aim is to make really that experience as easy as it is on a micro. Obviously it's, it's not quite perfect, but we're trying to get there. Um, we support all the common low speed I.O. protocols, so GPIO, I2C, SPI, UART, things like that. We're pretty agnostic to kernel versions and we support a load of different access methods. So, for example, for GPIO, we do everything from SysFS. We support DevUIO, DevMem for horrific boards, and even GPIO via the new car dev interface in the kernel from 4.0, I can't remember, uh, which is way nicer. And based on that, we actually let you do full GPIO line access now, which is much, much more efficient. But we still have a failover mode to do it on SysFS if you have an older kernel or an older board. Um, we also have our own IAO user space interface. Um, mostly it was initially done for ADCs uh, because we typically don't suggest writing user space ADC drivers. That's typically a bit inefficient. Um, and we also do UART and emulated one wire on UART. And just last week we merged some patches from Linaro to add um, the LME kernel uh, subsystem so we can do uh, that directly from Libra. And the target audience really is monkeys. So it's, it's dumb, it's easy, and it just works. That's really the, the main concept. We, we try to really emulate the easiness uh, from the light control of the world. And there's just a few things that because of that we, we can't do. And that, that's fine, that's, that's part of the limitations. Um, like I said, it's for quick prototyping, and we're finding, you know, 
In 2017, no one really throws away a prototype anymore, so we've kind of tried to adapt that into products and try to make a few things to make it actually easier to develop on. And generally, our users are, are used to handling software at a much higher level um, the Linux kernel, so they may not have access or the ability to rebuild their own kernel. They might be on a specific vendor kernel. Uh, they may not have the skills to rebuild a Linux kernel to start with. Um, and, and we're in re real world, so we often have uh, vendor-specific kernels, things that aren't super clean, um, and it's not always possible to just upgrade the latest kernel to get the car dev subsystem, for example. Um, and we have uh, APIs in C, C++, Node.js, Java, and Python. Uh, and C++ is header-only, Python is wig with some typeface work, and our Node.js is kind of a halfway house. Um, with we're struggling a bit with Node.js 7 support, but we, we have 6 support, and we're looking at moving to from Swig to NBind for that. Um, and we support loads and loads of boards, and the aim is to abstract the platform quirks. So really support the actual board as much as possible so that it reflects the hardware data sheet from the SOC or the board vendor. And it's sometimes harder than you, you'd believe. Uh, so straight on, here's the uh, quick and ugly C API demo. Uh, so as you can see, it's context-based. Uh, once you initialize the context, uh, which we handle, it's a hidden point to a strut. You can pass it around, and you can close it with the aptly named close function. Uh, and next to it is a little table that I got from a data sheet from the Intel Edison, as you can <laughs> see. Uh, this is one of the kernels, which is slightly more weird. And it gives you an idea of kind of what we actually do in the background when you actually do this call. So when you actually go and ask for a GPIO, we basically go look in the table for you. We'll do the pin muxing for you if it's not done nicely. Um, we'll essentially kind of fix it up so it does the right thing. And on some platforms, it's actually even hard to get the data sheet. So it's, it's kind of, let's say, nice and easy. And we, we get a lot of people, actually, that, that use it simply because of that, you know. Um, and we find a lot of manufacturers do really good SOC level IO support. But then you get an ODM that turns up. They make a random board. They put a bunch of GPIOs on it that aren't controlled by normal means or normal ways. And no mainline kernel support, of course. Um, and it's especially common with add-on and daughter boards and um, SOM designs, so sock on module. Um, I won't name anyone. Um, and then we have our C++ API, which is our header-only API. It's not really fancy, but what we do is we, we change our context to be objects. And all our Swig APIs are based on this. So previously, we had Swig generate objects using uh, type maps, and this was a massive, massive mess. So to reduce the size of our wrappers, we started using this, and it, it seems to be a bit easier to maintain. Um, we do actually have unsupported bindings for Haskell, R, Go, PHP, and Lua. Uh, Lua one's probably the only one that might get merged at some point, but if you're interested in one of those, uh, we could have a chat. Um, and then here's our Python API. So kind of the same. We even have some Python docs that are generated, so it can make it weird reading. Uh, we do Python 2 and Python 3, um, separate binaries, but they are built on the same sources. Um, and then some more Python. Um, and you can see that most of our calls are actually synchronous, uh, including for JavaScript, which means that we don't have that many fans. Uh, and it's because we're, we're really time sensitive. So uh, when we benchmarked it, we made, we made some asynchronous calls, like some really basic stuff, and we found that actually it was really, really slow to make a thread and destroy it just for one simple I.O. operation. And at the end of the day, most I.O. operations require you to really get the result back, and you kind of want it as soon as possible to go on the next thing. So we found that it didn't really make that much sense. Um, but we're still curious to see why it was really so bad. Um, we did a few tests with some, let's say, non-trivial stuff, and it was still pretty slow. Uh, so we, we kind of recommend now making the sensor read completely async, but not the I.O. calls themselves. Um, obviously, some people in the JS community disagree with us. Um, and finally, one of the things that we would get asked is, you know, why, why a unified API? What's the point? And, all, and I have a cool demo that hopefully will convince you. Um, so we have this cool little uh, JavaScript-based, uh, web-based, actually, MRA implementation, which shows you the, the JS implementation of MRA. And if I can type correctly, which is a bit of an ask. Um, right. We can basically make a GPIO. Uh, and we can write to it. Uh, it turns on. Um, so that's, 
I'd say a fun way of showing uh, why a uh, unified API is kind of handy. We can basically make it run on a web browser. We can make it run on, the, on, on, on any hardware. And we have, let's say, multiple implementations of it. Um, but really, the, the real big reason for doing this is, excuse my looking at the screen, uh, is that on top of this, we can basically put a bunch of sensors. So on top of our API, uh, that, that's kind of unified, we, we managed to basically load a load of different sensor libraries on top. And what we did is we, we created UPM, which is useful plugins from RAW. And we made around 400 sensors that would basically be loaded on top of, of MRA. And we're constantly adding more. And we take pull requests again. This is, again, fully open source. Um, and you can basically go and look up any of the sensors that you like and uh, try and add it to your project. So for example, my favorite temperature sensor, the BMP-280. And everyone should have a favorite temperature sensor. I think it's just like a basic. Um, and, uh, and basically for this, you can get, um, sometimes you get a nice picture, you get a little description, we have a link to the data sheet, uh, we have all our API nodes, um, some key specs, and then down at the bottom we have basically examples of making it run on any language, and if you go look at there, they're not always perfect, I mean they are auto-generated, so it'd be a little bit nice, um, but the idea is you can get the basic idea of how you would run that sensor. Um, and again, we, we try and make this as easy as possible. So when you add a sensor and you give us a pull request from the documentation that you give us, this is essentially auto-generated. So again, be nice. It's not always super, super nice. Um, and then we give you a few little examples on some platforms. There might be something a little bit weird about that sensor. So you need to make sure that something is, um, is set up right. So let's go back to... Okay, that was the EPM slide. Um, so hopefully at this point, you're thinking, well, this is cool. How do I add my platform? Um, and what do you support? So here it is, a bunch of boards that we support, um, random pictures, no real order. Uh, and what that means by the board supported is that we have the pins mapped, and it all works out of the box. Uh, you get some docs. Uh, we've tested it a little bit. Uh, and uh, hopefully... You'll notice it's, it's much bigger than Intel. You know, we, we support boards from all around the place. Uh, we've got uh, 96 boards from the Naro, well, the 96 board spec, mostly the Dragon 410C, I think, is the one they're using. Uh, MediaTek have just added two new boards uh, just recently. Um, Google did the BeagleBone Green, which I think is on it. And uh, Phytech have their BeagleBone clones. Uh, I think they're, they're slightly different. There's a few little patches for them. Um, and we can support all the Raspberry Pi versions. I can't remember how many versions, loads of them. Uh, and like, for example, the whole Minibboard series and stuff is supported. Um, and we have a bunch of different ways to add platforms to Libra. So the first method is what we call the raw platform. And essentially, it's not writing a platform. It's similar to how you'd use GPIO libs. Uh, we don't actually do any cleverness of mapping or try and work out what you have. You just initialize pin numbers as they are in CFS. Uh, or in, in, in your kernel is booted. Uh, and it's, it's pretty poor because one of the problems we get is, for example, you refer to dev ice 2 c one but really when it boots, it can be randomly assigned. Um, you can't actually guarantee that dev ice 2 c one is going to be your device unless you're on some special stuff. Um, and, and based on firmware, this could change. So internally, uh, we use this API, uh, but typically we don't advise it for anything than just development and playing around. Um, the main reason people use this is through the C platform config files, and this is the main way we add boards. And really, uh, we think it's relatively easy. We've gotten a bunch of PRs with absolutely no help from middle of nowhere to do this, so it doesn't seem too difficult. Um, we sort them by arch type. Uh, the MRA library tries to be portable across dev board. Um, so for example, you can run on a middle board, copy over the binary, and run it on a cherry trail base up. Um, we do actually separate the architectures because there's no point in putting the ARM support boards with the x86 ones. You're not going to be able to copy the binary anyway. Um, and you can compile it for a specific board to reduce binary size. We've got loads of different compile options that let you do that. Um, the cool thing about this is you're able to override some of the MRA specific um, functionality. So we actually have our testing board, which is the mock board, which overrides essentially everything the board does um, and triggers a bunch of tests rather than actually real I.O. operations. But we do this for supporting boards that are FMATA-based. We support the D2XX FTTI driver, uh, things like that. And then our last way of doing things is for our JSON platform API. 
and this lets you add a relatively simple board. This assumes that the kernel mostly works on your board. Um, and essentially, you're able to define your board um, in a simple JSON, uh, JSON file and load it at a runtime or set an environment variable to load it up. And we've done this actually for Intel Aero boards, which is those little drones that Intel has. Um, and I think they don't use it for the nav. I hope not. Uh, but um, with, for example, things like the middle board Turbot will load like this uh, really easily, and you don't need to actually do any actual coding inside Mara. So that's quite cool. Um, and now we come to the weird stuff. So, excuse me as I change gears a little bit. Um, but so the the reason for this talk was really how do we apply um, Ra to um, instead of doing uh, direct kernel access, which obviously requires us to have permissions that are a little bit dangerous. Uh, we you know go in, and some boards will end up hitting dev men, which is obviously a big no no. Um, but dev UI or even CFS can be a little bit tricky. Um, and our first attempt to basically solve this problem was to use a daemon called imra, which would basically load on boot time and try and set the permissions for the various IOs with the permission uh, that the users that you had set that would use these IOs later. Um, and this kind of worked relatively well for simple platforms, but it didn't really scale. And we had a lot of problems on more complex platforms and Noxes where it wouldn't really work properly, uh, or it required real intricate knowledge of how it worked. Um, so then we worked with Google on Android things. Um, and they had an interesting problem because they, they created this thing called Peripheral Manager, or PIO, um, which is really basically a daemon and you request IO operations uh, to be done um, with it through the Android binder. And it checks that you're allowed to basically do this access, that you have permission to this bus or this specific device. Um, but they didn't really have any sensors on it. And like a lot of the new APIs, you know, it was different, it was new, and it basically didn't really have much. Um, I think they had two sensors examples on this. Um, and we did a dev kit with them, and we thought, well, you know, instead of porting all of our sensors, which is what they asked us to do initially, uh, we thought that's a lot of work. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll do the lazy, you know, halfway route. We'll port our base API and just make a backend uh, that actually calls a peripheral manager instead of actually calling the direct kernel functionality. And then we'll let PIO actually do that work. Um, and actually, the PIO API luckily was very, very similar to ours. Um, I dare say it's a copy. Um, and we made what we call PMRA. Uh, we like to prefix things in front of MRA. We have like ZMRA, WMRA, DMRA. Yeah, it's bad jokes. Um, but essentially, um, what we did is that instead of calling dev i2cn, suddenly you were actually asking for the peripheral manager for i squared c bus n, and then doing operations based on it through that. And we use our Java bindings, and that's actually when we, we made our Java bindings way better than they were before. Um, and we added a few different little things, like we added a MRA init IO call that takes a string argument and returns you a hidden context so you can do some slightly more dynamic stuff. Um, and then because we, we increased and uh, made Limra's backend much better, we were actually able to um, uh, merge all that work back into the, the mainline MRA. So you can now basically compile a Android things MRA. And our one thing to note is uh, when we talk about backends, we have some backends that are unique. So like MRA, uh, the peripheral manager one, or even the AFB one. And we have others that are um, treated as sub-platforms. So you can actually have two backends running in MRA at the same time. So when we run a Fermata board, typically we consider that an add-on board. So you're able to do IO directly on your SBC, and then do IO on the Fermata board by basically adding a um, an offset to your I.O. numbers. So when you ask for bus 512, you'll actually get the USB uh, controlled uh, Fermata board or Bluetooth enabled board um, instead of your native board. But for peripheral manager, obviously you only have one board, so that's really the native board. And we start the numbering just like they do in peripheral manager. Um, and so you can see that's kind of how the stack ends up looking. You get your application in Java, it calls MRA Java, and then it calls um, LibRA with the peripheral uh, backend, which calls and calls the Android binder, requests basically access to things, and the peripheral manager essentially does the operation on the kernel directly. So we don't actually ever touch the kernel in this case. And so now we can move on to the um, AFB part of the presentation, which is the whole reason really um, I did this. And um, so the base of it, 
Um, it's probably a whole presentation. I hope some of you guys watch the AGL presentation next door. Um, but it's it's a way to connect applications to services promoted by um, the automotive grade Linux group. And in um, I have a slide. There we go. Um, and essentially, the way it works is you have a security context, um, which is ensured by SMAC. And you run an application connected to a local binder. And the binder runs in the same security uh, context as your application. And the binder lets you basically load dynamic libraries with a few magic hooks, uh, which essentially load a service that you can call from your application. And you can actually do this uh, either on the same security context, but actually you can do it in a different security context. And you still call your local binder, but it's actually going to call a service that's running in a different application in a different context. And you can do this over the network. You can do this uh, completely locally. And it's completely transparent to the calling application. Uh, so the application always talks to its local binder, uh, which, it clo which exposes the bindings it's got access to. Um, and essentially, the, the binders can be connected by DBus, WebSockets, or other, other connection types. But it doesn't actually matter as part of the, um, uh, the, the, the calling application. And what's really cool about AFB is it doesn't actually require AGL, although it is a component of it. Uh, so you can install it on basically anything that's running Linux, which has a non-ancient JSON C. Uh, there's some packages. You can do it in modern uh, in common distros out of the box, but it's basically a few minutes to compile. It's really, really easy. It's just standard CMake, nothing special. And with the binder comes a few like utils and demo tools that are quite nice. But really, what we're interested in is the lib AFB WSC. So I'll have to explain that naming. Um, but it's it's what Mirai uses to contact its local binder. So it's really a pretty easy API, and essentially you basically pass a JSON C, a, a JSON message, which goes through JSON C, and essentially you're you're off to um, to calling a function in in your binding. Um, you can do this in C, which is what I did, but you can apparently do it in Lua. It's really easy. I don't know, haven't looked. Um, so if we have a little look at how it works. So that's the, the simple picture of how um, how we basically plug in Mirai to AFB. And the kind of cool thing is we run two Mirai's, uh, which makes me particularly happy. Uh, so the, the way it works is we have one Mirai with the AFB backend and one Mirai that runs normally. And here we put them all in the same security context to make it a little bit easier, but I'll show you the more complex one afterwards. Um, but the idea is that the application calls the Mirai with the backend with the AFB backend, the AFB backend talks to the actual binder with the binding loaded, and actually the binding is linked to Libra, the normal one, and by normal I mean the one with the actual hardware platform support. Your AFB MRA is compiled just for the AFB platform. So you do have to do some magic to have two libraries. Um, and the way it works is the, the permissions are entirely handled by AFB, uh, by, by the binder. So you can basically say, well, this application only has access to run this I squared C on this address. Um, so it's really quite perfect. Well, two addresses and seven bit. But, um, but really, you can only send and receive messages uh, that were intended for you. Uh, and you can't access the bus directly anymore because it's hidden by essentially AFB. We're not able to access the local I.O. And that's what's really cool. Um, so let me show you the more complex picture, which actually does some of this. Um, and this is, I try to make this kind of funky. Um, um, so hopefully that shows a little bit more what I'm talking about. But in this diagram, which actually the way I developed it, uh, we have a Fermata board. So we're not actually hitting the Linux kernel directly. We're actually hitting a Fermata board that's connected via UART. Um, and what we're doing is talking from our application to an I squared C UPM sensor, like a BMP280. And then that's talking to our Libra with our AFB backend, which is making a binder call for the AFMRA binding. Once we do that, we enter the, the, the that binder security context. So suddenly, we're able to actually make a UART call. But before, we don't have access to the UART of our kernel. And suddenly, from our Fermata-enabled Libra, we're able to hit the UART and go and call our Fermata board. So actually, in this, it's it's relatively complex because we're actually um, going for an I2C MRA call from UPM into the binder, which is then transforming it into a JSON message, passing it into um, two verbs that have been called on the AFMRA binding, which then converts it to a MIDI message, 
to be passed via UART, and Fermata is a MIDI kind of base protocol, uh, which will actually then do the I.O. operation. So as you can see, it's relatively non-trivial, um, but it all works actually relatively easily because we already have that part of the stack, and all we need to do is basically transform the MRAR calls into JSON uh, verb, uh, well, functions, AFB calls, verbs, essentially function calls, um, with the right arguments to the binding, which actually calls the MRAR calls directly. And So our AFB backend basically works by extending the MRAR API while overriding some of the functionality. So every libmra call actually has the possibility for overrides on its normal behavior. So uh, we usually did this because of odd platforms like the X1000 Quark platform or non-standard kernels like some of the RPI stuff, um, or because we weren't talking to Linux directly, uh, like for Marta-based platforms, E2XX, Peripheral Manager. And the AGL platform is just an example of that. So we compile it with the build arch AFB. And this triggers all the calls to go to the AFB bus rather than directly to the kernel. And once we do that, we override all the platform functionality. So we no longer have basically a standard platform. We have an AGL style platform. Um, and I use AGL and AFB in, yeah, <laughs> should probably fix that. Um, but basically when we ask for dev i2cn, we really go off and we make a call via AFB WS J1 call S, uh, which is asynchronous, and that's a bit useless for us because we basically need to know the response straight away, so we basically go and wait a little bit. It's a bit inefficient, we probably need to fix that. Uh, but for example, there are things that for the platform name, for example, we actually don't need permission for that one, so we can go grab that directly. So there are some things that are done directly because we can do this directly from the binder, and there are some things we actually go and query the, the platform for. Uh, but the cool thing, as you can see now, is that we can interconnect different applications through the binder, and we can start QoSing it, we can start caching results for AIO calls, we can start caching those results if we're start asking for too much, things like that. Um, um, and so the, the AF MRA binding is typically linked uh, against the static libmra, uh, so then we can basically keep that, that easily available just for that binding, and then all the other applications are linked against the dynamic libmra, which is available on the system. Um, and it's obviously that version will be linked uh, to the hardware specifically, so it's really basically to treat the hardware rather than the AFB bus. Um, all the AFB bus actually functionality is in the binding itself uh, rather than in the, in the libmra. Um, so it can get a little bit confusing because you essentially have two versions of the library, which means syslog is a little bit of a mess, but that's um, part of what we'll fix in the, in the future. Uh, and um, now we get on to the, the, the future and what we're doing. So there's a bunch of stuff left to do. I didn't do quite as much as I wanted to before this presentation. Um, so currently, uh, the AGL platform in MRA has no real knowledge of what's supported on the platform. Uh, we have no based introspection, uh, which we normally do on a platform, so we're able to query what we have and what we can do. Uh, currently, it's kind of, let's say, an ask and forget mode. Um, so you, you'll get refused if you're not able to, of course, but we basically don't have the ability to tell you what you can do. Uh, it's not quite as nice. Um, and our binding is pretty simplistic. It provides, um, it's based on the version two of the um, AFB binder, um, but it's pretty simplistic in that we only have two verbs. Uh, we have dev init and we have a command, which is basically a MRA command against an initialized context. Um, and I think in the future we'll try and clean that up so you can actually use the binding directly um, and actually use it without another libmra if you wanted to and do calls directly through that. Um, and you currently you can, but it's just a little bit ugly and we haven't made any effort to make that nice. Um, and one of the other things that currently are, uh, the, the calls to AFB are all asynchronous, and we basically have to lock on that, and that's a little bit nasty, so um, we've got a bit of a hack to do that nice and a bit efficiently, but we'll probably just write um, a new AFB call that lets us do that directly, which is a bit easier. Um, and the last thing is that we essentially have the I2C functionality all working, but we don't have any of the other MRA IO protocols. And this is more because I wanted to make one work nicely, get some feedback, see where it was going. Um, and as soon as we have that working nicely, we'll move on to the other ones. Um, 
and some of the other protocols. I think the I squared C one is probably one of the most widely used that we have, and it's it's probably one of the more complex ones anyway. Um, so we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. Hopefully, the ones will fall along relatively easily when we when we have that. Um, and then I've got some further reading in docs if you want to look up more things. So it's all on um, our GitHub page. Um, we have Mara, we have the uh, Mara binding, which lives in a slightly different place. Um, we also have the UPM website, and UPM lives on the same GitHub. You just put slash UPM and you end up on there. Um, we're fairly active on GitHub issues if you have any problems or you want to play with it. Uh, there's a docs folder in Mara that explains a little bit of the compilation and how to do that. Um, and we obviously have a free node IRC channel, uh, which I'm usually on, uh, a mailing list. Um, yeah, GitHub issues seems to be where most people go. Um, but yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot for listening. And um, any questions? I don't have a microphone. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can hear. So we've not really tried to be real time because we're, let's say, way too far up the stack to really even pretend. Um, we're more hitting stuff that's not real time critical. So there's plenty of sensor readings, for example, which aren't necessarily real time. You need an answer, let's say, relatively quickly, but exactly when is not necessarily required. Um, yeah, if you want real time stuff, you're going to need to be way deeper down. Uh, I don't think this is going to solve your need. Uh, we are not deterministic. <laughs> I mean, that, that's part of the aim, right? It's, it's meant more at prototyping and doing fast dev, not rebuilding the kernel, doing things quickly. And then if you need to move further down, then you do need to be deterministic, then you need to move down the kernel. And we, we, that's why partly why we have the IIO stuff. Um, so we're able to do a user space binding on top of an IIO uh, kernel sensor. And I guess that could be relatively deterministic, depending on how you compile your kernel. Um, and we have done that for certain platforms that, that want that. But even then, I mean, when you're calling that from user space, you're back to not being deterministic. Um. So it depends on which platform you look at. There are definitely some where we're very hard coded. Uh, there are some when we go and look at the PCI IDs for stuff. Um, I don't know. We'd have to have a chat about which ones you looked at and what what you thought was bad. But there's there's some magic that we do. Uh, for example, for supporting different kernel versions. Like for example, on the middleboard Max, when the kernel changed the Max and RGPIO value. Uh, so basically, if we wanted to support two different kernels, we have to basically do a bit of magic. Uh, we can't actually get that value from the kernel, so we have to do a bit of magic. Um, there are a few little things that we've not managed to get. Um, but yeah, I mean, some of, the, some of the platform support is not always perfect, especially I think the, the Raspberry Pi one comes to mind as the one that's fairly nasty. Um, but you're more than welcome to file the bug if you see something that you think is nasty. So we actually have support for both. So we have support for the char dev, uh, although it's still in a branch, so you have to go look for it. Um, but we have SysFS, we have char dev, and then some platforms will use dev UIO if that's something that they specified. Um, but yeah, we, we are mer looking to merge the char dev stuff really soon. Um, but yeah, that's only it's gonna work on newer kernels, obviously. And that's still difficult on a lot of SBCs to run brand new kernels. Okay, well, thank you very much.